las dos cosas. O hacemos eh, parte. Uh, as, you, as, as you already know, this is uh, the talk today is within the, the cycle of seminars uh, um, provided by Cathedra Sanka of Nanotechnology. This is within the, uh, the conference uh, cycle of uh, Nanostros, the spin off talk. And uh, this will be all the, the, almost the last one of this year. It's my pleasure today to uh, present Dr. Yves Haftel from the Instituto de, Nano, de, Nano, sorry, the Instituto de Ciencia de Materiales de Madrid. He is a research, he is a research scientist since one year ago. Uh, I think I just, uh, he was writing granted uh, one year ago, but uh, for sure he, uh, he joined FESIC as a uh, Ramon and Cajal uh, fellowship. And then he continued uh, in the same center uh, till, till today. Uh, in the meantime, uh, he participated in the foundation of uh, at least two spin off companies that are still running. One of them is uh, quite recent, it's almost one year life. And I think is the, the topic for today how the idea become to become a reality. And uh, I would like also to emphasize that uh, he's uh, combining not only um, a, a breakthrough research at lab, at lab level, he's also trying to uh, translate all this progress to, to, the, uh, to societal needs. And this is a good example of uh, what uh, one of our main goals as a researchers just trying to translate our results to the full benefits of the society. Uh, 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 his main topic is the synthesis of nanoparticles in gas phase. I think he will focus on this aspect today. And uh, um, I don't want to, 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 to spend more time with this uh, presentation. Uh, I think it was, uh, you can start when you want, start your sharing your screen. Um, um, and welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much. The floor is yeah, yours. I will start uh, sharing my screen right okay. now. I, I don't know. I was not sure if the talk was in English or in Spanish. Uh, what do you, what do you prefer? Uh, uh, I think it's, if 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 you don't mind, uh, keep it still in English, okay? okay? Because some students from the master are not in Spanish, so okay, it would be nice. That's fine. Uh, anyway, it will be a mixture of slides in English and, and Spanish. Uh, uh, sorry for that, but I uh, had to prepare this uh, this talk that is uh, really uh, a, a new talk for me. Uh, it's quite different from the talks I used to, to, to give, but I'm very happy to give this talk because this has been a, a good occasion for me to, to see um, what we have done the last years and uh, in some way to uh, try to understand how we came to this company called uh, Nanostein. So I will talk about Nanostein, uh, but I will focus my, my talk more on the, the, as I said in my title, uh, the journey uh, from the ideas to the creation of a company. Um, so I will, I will first start to explain what is Nanostein. Nanostein is a spin-off of the CSIC and we are devoted to fabricate nanoparticles and nanostructure uh, coatings. It's a company that came from the CSIC because it has a patent uh, from the CSIC and another company. And we produce and, and sell nanoparticles and uh, nanostructured uh, coatings. So our main activity is to engineer nanoparticles. Uh, when a customer wants a specific nanoparticle, we think how to do it. And uh, fortunately we, we do it just for the need of the customer. We have also a consulting service. And one of the main, um, Aspects is that we work with ultra pure uh, materials. Our nanoparticles or coatings are very pure. And we focus on strategic sectors 
where the price really is not very important because um, our technology is quite expensive. We are in the Parque Científico de Madrid in uh, the University, Autonomous University of uh, Madrid. And this is the team. I have uh, highlighted in, in red the co-founders of the company, uh, myself, my colleague Lydia Martinez, and uh, my colleague Jose Miguel Garcia Martin, together with Miguel Carretero and uh, uh, Ivan Fernandez, and the participation of FI Group and Nano for Energy, we created the company um, about two years ago. Recently, we hired um, a new CEO, Daniel Gonzalez, and uh, Dr. Sandra Cortijo for the ID department. And uh, since almost the beginnings, we have uh, Cesar Rodriguez for the production. So, uh, Long time ago, as we say in, in the stories, um, uh, uh, what happened? I want to, to spend some time on, on this graph because this is the key point for nanotechnology. I have represented uh, the density of states of electrons inside the material as a function of energy, right? So here, at the zero, this is the Fermi edge. And then we have electronic states. When we are in a 3D material, the curve is continuous, which means that you can find electrons at any energy. In a 2D material, like a surface, the situation is quite different because you have a quantification of the states, electronic states. When you go to the 1D dimension, like uh, wires, you have uh, this strange distribution of electrons. And when you go to zero, di uh, zero dimensional uh, materials, like nanoparticles or clusters, you have ex extremely quantified energy distribution. And this is the key point, because <clears throat> as you reduce the size of your object, the density of states which means the electrons that will participate in most of the properties of the materials, not only electronic properties, but also magnetic properties, optical properties, mechanical properties, will change pretty much as a function of dimension. That's why nanotechnology is so popular now, because we can make nan nanoparticles or, or other materials that have a really different electronic states and different properties as a function of size. So a long time ago in the 80s, 90s, surface science was uh, a passion. And I want to show you those, this example because I like it pretty much. These autos um, deposited small clusters or nanoparticles of gold on top of a titanium oxide a substrate. Here you have an STM image of the clusters. And they show that these clusters could oxidate the CO. And most interestingly, they have shown that the activity or the oxidation of the, of the CO was pretty much dependent on the size of the nanoparticles or the clusters. Here, the difference between cluster and nanoparticle is not very uh, uh, Clarified, but uh, sometimes I will use clusters, sometimes I will uh, use the term nanoparticle. But as you can see, gold that is quite inert can act as a catalyst if the size of the, the, the dimension is around three nanometer diameter. So, following this, this kind of studies, my case, I was uh, studying uh, uh, iron nanoparticles. You can see here in the FMA images, the nanoparticles made of iron. And in this TM image, you can clearly see the nanoparticles grown on top of a sapphire substrate. But the key point here, in order to get these uh, nanoparticles and not a thin film, was to heat the, the sapphire substrate at 1,000 
Kelvin. And this has a very strong uh, impact, as we will see. But anyway, this temperature was necessary in order to give enough energy to the atoms in order to um, push them to migrate and form these nanoparticles that we wanted to, to study. But what we, we did is to study these, uh, the magnetic properties of these clusters using a, a care uh, effect. And here you have the hysteresis curves of different deposits of this uh, uh, iron nanoparticles. And what we did in situ was to deposit a capping layer on top of these nanoparticles. We started first with aluminum. And as you can see, the hysteresis curve is not modified. We have not modified the magnetic properties of the system. But this is not the case when we deposit iron capping or platinum capping or even palladium capping. And what we found is that there is a connection between the nanoparticles when we deposit, of course, iron because we form a continuous layer of iron, but also with platinum and palladium. And this was caused by a polarization, magnetic polarization of the capping layer with a thickness of seven uh, angstrom approximately. Then we wanted to, more, to know more about the structure of these uh, uh, nanoparticles. And we performed XPS at different depths of the system. And we can, we can focus only on, on this red curve, which was measured here in the middle of the nanoparticles, iron nanoparticles. And on the black curve here, black spectrum, that was measured close to the interface with the uh, sapphire substrate. As you can see, there are two more peaks here in this photomission spectrum. And these peaks belong to an iron oxide. This means that our system was not that simple, that it was not made of iron nanoparticles with a simple capping. It was more like this one with a sapphire, iron oxide, iron, then a layer that was polarized or probably uh, an alloy with the capping layer. And that was very frustrating for us because what we wanted, what we needed for our, let's say, fundamental studies is a simple system that we could understand. This system that we created is extremely complicated. We have a gradient of oxygen inside the iron nanoparticles. And it's hardly, it's very hard to simulate the magnetic properties. So we came to the conclusion that we needed another way to fabricate nanoparticles. Fortunately, other scientists in another field already created a way to make clusters or nanoparticles. So you can see this publication is from 85. And these authors were able to make metal clusters. Like in this spectrum, we can clearly see that what they were able to make atomic uh, clusters or B atomic clusters of silver atoms. And at that time, they were pretty much interested in creating a beam of clusters and to send this beam on a surface and to see the study the impact of these clusters on the surface. And they used what is called iron cluster source. What are iron cluster source? In all the cases, what we need is to create um, a vapor of atoms and then recombine the atoms in a form of clusters or in the form of nanoparticles. These are the kind of iron cluster sources that have been developed along the years. In all cases, you create a vapor of atoms using a crucible or an oven or a laser or a magnetron. With the years, the system that works with magnetrons became more popular because it is more easy to manipulate to use. 
The other advantage is that the nanoparticles or clusters that you produce are, are highly charged. Approximately 80% of the clusters or the nanoparticles are charged, which means that you can filter them if you want to reduce the size distribution. <coughs> so how it works? This is a cluster source based on a magnetron. You have a magnetron inside a cavity here that is closed aggregation zone. You extract the atoms from a target using the plasma of the magnetron. Uh, if you are lucky and you have uh, a density high enough inside the aggregation zone, the atoms will collide with each other and they will start to form clusters and eventually nanoparticles. Thanks to uh, differential pumping here, we can create with a venturi type of, of uh, pumping, a beam that can be extracted from the aggregation zone and projected in this direction where you place your substrate you want to cover with nanoparticles. This system has been uh, invented by uh, uh, Professor Haveland in the 90s. And here I have, I have, I have highlighted the, the elements that can be used in this kind of a magnetron based uh, cluster source. As you can see, there are many elements of the periodic table that you can use. So it is quite, quite versatile. And since 2001, this system is commercially available. So you can buy it. And they're called ion cluster source, cluster GAN, gas aggregation sources, or sputter gas aggregation sources. So we had the possibility to buy a system that could allow us to form, to fabricate nanoparticles in a very clean way. And these are the main advantages. First, we work in ultra high vacuum conditions or vacuum conditions, which means that we don't have impurities in the atmosphere where we create the nanoparticles, which means that we have very few nanoparticles. The other advantage is that we can control the size of the nanoparticles from one to 30 nanometers, and we control the density of the nanoparticles we deposit on a substrate. The fabrication of the nanoparticles is independent uh, from the substrate preparation. Not, not like the case of my um, iron nanoparticles, where we had to, to heat the substrate to 1,000 uh, Kelvin. So we can deposit the nanoparticles on any substrate that is vacuum compatible. We can also introduce gases inside the aggregation zone in order to promote some chemical reactions with the atoms when the nanoparticles are being formed. The nanoparticles are ligand free, which means that we can use all the surface of the nanoparticles. And the nanoparticles have the same chemical composition as the original material. And this last point can be an advantage, but also a limitation, because when you want to form alloys or Cauchy nanoparticles, you have to use a mixed target. And for the formation of uh, the alloy, you should uh, be sure that the, the elements of the nanoparticles will not diffuse inside the nanoparticle. And then when you want to make Cauchy nanoparticles, you've got to choose a combination of elements in such a way that one element will migrate to the surface, for example, in order to form the, the core, the shell, sorry. So this is uh, limiting. The other limitation is every time you want to change the chemical composition of your nanoparticles, you have to open the system and replace the target inside the magnetron. And as you remember, we are working in ultra high vacuum conditions, which means that after changing the target, you have to pump down the whole system in order to reach again the vacuum or ultra high vacuum conditions, which can take several days. So not very uh, easy to change the target or change the chemical composition. Anyway, 
we were quite happy. We, we bought the commercial uh, plus to source and we started to, to, to make fundamental studies. This is a case where we used an alloy target with 95% of cobalt and 5% of gold. And we were able to make these nanoparticles. Using TEM, we were able to show that the cobalt is distributed over the whole nanoparticle. We have some oxygen on the border of the nanoparticle and the 5% of the gold is also distributed in the whole nanoparticle. So we have an alloy nanoparticle with some cobalt oxide nanoparticle at the edge of the nanoparticle. And by making an annealing at 500 Kelvin uh, approximately, we were able to provoke the diffusion of the gold outside the nanoparticle. As you can see here, uh, the gold is not anymore distributed in the whole nanoparticle. It is located mostly at the edge of the nanoparticle. So we could get a core shell nanoparticle using this annealing trick. But this was too limiting, really. Then we faced uh, the problem of combining different elements inside a single cluster source. So this is a, that was the first um, techno technological limitation we, we were facing, really. And we had to find a solution for that. And we came with a solution that consists in replacing the single magnetron inside the aggregation zone, but three smaller, because the space is limited, three smaller magnetrons inside the aggregation zone, in such a way that when we wanted to make fewer nanoparticles, we just used one magnetron. As you can see, we were able to make gold nanoparticles with a high crystallinity. When we wanted to make alloyed nanoparticles, we put the two magnetrons uh, at the same distance in such a way that the plus mass of the two magnetrons could mix and form alloyed nanoparticles like this one, uh, gold, silver alloy nanoparticle. But the advantage of having these magnetrons that can be placed at different uh, distances from the exit of the aggregation zone is that we could place uh, the red magnetron behind, nucleate the red atoms in a, a nanoparticle. Then when it passes through the plasma of the second magnetron is covered by the atoms of the second magnetron. This allows us to form core shell nanoparticles in a single step without the need of annealing or dot treatments. Here you have the example in TEM. So you can see uh, the gold that is uh, uh, heavier, that has more electrons is brighter. And we clearly have a shell of gold surrounding the core of the silver nanoparticle. But we could also make the inverse by placing the magnetrons like this, just and make a gold nanoparticle covered by a silver shell. Here, the silver shell that is um, not crystalline because the silver is oxidized, right? So thanks to this modification of the cluster source, we are now able to make nanoparticles with um, controlled chemical composition because the density of the plasmas can be controlled by the voltage we apply to each magnetron. So we can uh, fix or modify to uh, the density of atoms of one element uh, during the formation of the nanoparticles. We can control the structure as we can make core shell nanoparticles. And this allows us to make uh, nanoparticles that in principle uh, that are not available with other uh, um, fabrication methods. So this patent was licensed um, to Oxford Upper Research and it is still uh, um, running. 
So uh, more recently, 2010, uh, we faced another problem. I, I told you that we could, we can make clusters or nanoparticles of few atoms up to 30 uh, nanometers diameter. It is, it is fine if you have a TEM microscope uh, in your lab, because then you can uh, characterize this, uh, for example, gold nanoparticles by TEM. Even if they are very small, you can clearly see them and characterize them. And uh, I would like to now to, to thank my, my colleague, Alvaro Mayoral, who did an excellent TEM work during all these years. And uh, thanks to, to his ability to make this uh, extremely uh, uh, powerful characterizations, we could understand many, many things. And uh, actually, Alvaro is very close to you because it is in the uh, Institute for Na of Nanoscience Nio Science and Materials of Aragon. But OK, we, we, we don't have uh, uh, an, an ATM available every day. So uh, what we use is an AFM, atomic force microscopy. This is our routine tool to characterize the nanoparticles. But you clearly understand that the resolution is not as good as a TM. And here yeah, we'll thank uh, my colleague, Lydia Martinez, who is uh, the expert in the group uh, who makes uh, the AFM images. And I will, would like to say that when we started to make very small nanoparticles, Lydia started to complain because she could not measure them uh, with the atomic force microscopy. So we were facing another problem. We wanted to make uh, small nanoparticles, but we were not able to characterize them, uh, except using the TM that is, is more expensive, of course. So the question came, how can we increase the resolution in atomic force microscopy? So just to remember you, the atomic force microscope uh, is based on the cantilever that is deflected when the T is in contact or close contact with the object that you are measuring. And this deflection is measured uh, by a photodiode and you can create an image of the surface you are uh, measuring. So how can we increase the resolution of these measurements? The FM uh, resolution, the resolution, the resolution of the FM images is extremely dependent on the sharpness of the tip you are using. You can understand that the tip is uh, convoluted with the surface you want to measure. If you have a tip like this one, you will probably get this profile of this object and you won't see the asperities of your object, of your surface. There is a solution. You can use a very sharp tip. Then your tip will measure much better the profile of your object. But all the tips are made of silicon and they are quite fragile. So probably you will break your tip if you are not very cautious. Another problem is that you might be interested in making the morphology, making images of the morphology of your surface, but you will probably also uh, be interested in measuring the magnetic properties of your surface or the electrical potential of your surfaces or the hardness of your surfaces and so on. There are many, many applications of, of this microscopy. And in order to make this order, type of measurements like the magnetic measurements, you have to functionalize your tip by depositing a magnetic coating, for example. And when you deposit the coating, you increase the size of the apex of your tip. So the resolution become worse. And what we, uh, we came with is instead of depositing a continuous capping layer, is to deposit a nanoparticle coating 
in such a way that the very last nanoparticle at the end of the tip will act as the probe in your microscopy measurement. And we tested this by measuring nanoparticles. As you see, we have nanoparticles everywhere because we make nanoparticles every day. But this is a substrate of silicon covered by nanoparticles. <clears throat> and we measured this uh, surface with a tip with an apex of 10 nanometer diameter. The same tip covered by nanoparticles of seven nanometer diameter, and the tip covered by very small nanoparticles of two, three nanometer. And as you can see, the, the resolution improves significantly. While with the commercial tip with 10 nanometer diameter, you can hardly see the details of these two objects. With this tip, covered by small nanoparticles, you can de make the distinction between these nanoparticles that form agglomerates. And if we make a profile, we can even much better see that with the sharpest, or not the sharpest, the, the tip covered by the smallest nanoparticles, we can resolve much better the structures and even go down to the flat silicon uh, substrate. So we have increased uh, lateral resolution by coating these commercial tips, silicon commercial tips by nanoparticles. So we patented this, uh, this idea. And I just wanted to highlight here that we presented the, the, the patent in 2010, and it was accepted in 2012. And also in 2012, we uh, created, co-founded the company called Next Tip that was presented uh, a few weeks ago by uh, Manuel Espinosa. And here I want to just uh, say uh, a few words. Uh, I have been talking about the high resolution we wanted to improve the resolution in order to, to measure our small nanoparticles. But surprisingly, uh, the customers of uh, Next Tip were much more interested in the stability of the tips than the resolution. Because as you have this coating, there are many, many nanoparticles. If your tip gets contaminated by a molecule, for example, and you are working with a silicon tip, you have to remove the silicon tip and put another one. So you have to start again the measurements. But in the case of this coating, you can press the tip on the surface, remove the molecule, and you will still have a nanoparticle that will allow you to continue measuring, which is very, very convenient. So this, this is just uh, something that you work for an application thinking that the customers will like a special aspect of your tips. And at the end of the day, they prefer another one, but it's amazing. But this is not new. I mean, uh, putting something on the top or uh, on, on a stick, is not new. Um, uh, probably you don't know this person, but he's quite famous. This commandant, invented uh, the Fregona. I don't know the name in, in, in English, okay. but uh, this is the same uh, concept. You have a kind of a, a, a tick and you put something on, on top, right? And well, he had uh, some problems with, with the patent, but then he's known as the inventor of, of this uh, way to, to clean the, 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 the rooms and so on. And this is another one, also Spanish. I don't know if somebody knows him. He's quite famous. He, he should be very famous because he invented the chupa chups. Mm. Right? It's, uh, again, you put something on top of, of your stick. And uh, for, for the story is that he presented the patent in 1963. That's what was not accepted 
because of uh, no novelty. Uh, after that, he presented more patents that fortunately uh, were accepted. And uh, well, you all know this, uh, uh, this candies, right? So this is not new in, in Spain to put something on top of a stick. Huh. Right. Um, let's back to, to the magnetron and the plus two source. Uh, four years ago, we were facing another problem. Uh, our plus two source is based on a magnetron, as I told you. And uh, the magnetron has magnets and a target that you will erode with the plasma in order to eject the atoms. And because of the design of the magnets, the plasma is concentrated in what we call a race track, which means that most of the atoms will be ejected from this circular uh, 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 place. And this has a very uh, strong effect on the efficiency of the magnetron. Here I show you a curve where I have represented uh, a current that is proportional to the number of nanoparticles we are fabricating. And this curve was measured with a brand new gold target, flat surface. And we have compared the efficiency in forming nanoparticles with a used target which has a, a, the ray strike I was talking about. As you can see, there's a huge reduction in the production of nanoparticles. This is a well-known problem in magnetrons. And once you have this problem, you have to open again, open again and replace the target in order to continue fabricating the nanoparticles. So what we have done is to develop a new magnetron with the company Nano for Energy, where instead of having magnets that are fixed in a position, the magnets can rotate in such a way that the plasma is distributed over the whole target. So we can erode more uniformly the target. And the result is that instead of using only 5% of your target, 5% of the mass of your target, you can use it up to more than 30% of the target, which is very convenient first if you are using gold, which is quite expensive, but also because you don't have to open your system and to replace the target. And uh, secondly, you have a stable production of the nanoparticles. You don't have to calibrate your system or to make sure that the size of the nanoparticles or the number of the nanoparticles has changed upon the time. So we, we thought that at that point, we had solved most of the problems of these cluster sources um, and we could produce in a more industrial way nanoparticles. And when, uh, uh, Fundación General de CSIC invited us to uh, present a project for the creation of a spin off company. We applied and uh, we were selected uh, two, two years and a half ago. And we started uh, mentoring with the FI group and the SECOT. SECOT is uh, an organization. Uh, uh, which is uh, extremely useful of uh, senior, uh, retired sometimes, that want to keep an activity in, uh, in, um, in business. And they give a, a, a lot of ad very good advices, thanks to their experience. And our um, uh, proposal was to, uh, to fabricate at the, the industrial level nanoparticles with high added values. And two years ago, so we are, we are now, now approaching to the present, two years ago, 
we uh, had the opportunity opportunity to present a project to the uh, business incubation center of Madrid and uh, uh, fortunately our project was accepted and in the SABIC program and since then we have been working in coatings for uh, reducing the multipactor effect. The multipactor effect is a well-known problem in space because it appears when you have for example a waveguide that works with RF and in vacuum. The problem here is that um, all these uh, uh, devices like antenna waveguides in the space they are subjected to the impact of uh, particles high energy particles and when this happens uh, the surfaces of the device uh, eject uh, one or more electrons and this is cascade process that eventually produces uh, a big um, uh, breakdown voltage and damages the device. Since it is in the space, you cannot replace it and uh, you can lose, for example, an antenna communication. Right? So this, is, this has been a, a problem uh, and many have tried to find a solution. I have shown here the example when you have a high energy photon pinging on the surface of your device, it can emit electrons that have not stopped and then you eventually have the cascade I was talking about. If you have a more uh, uh, irregular surface, you might be able to capture the electrons and avoid the cascade. So our proposal was to make a kind of nanostructured a coating made of nanoparticles in order to stop the emission of the electrons. Here are some examples of what we have done so far. Thanks to the high production rate of nanoparticles, we are able to make uh, deposits of gold nanoparticles of several microns in a, in a limited time. And we have found that these coatings made of gold nanoparticles are quite efficient in capturing the electrons. Here you have the secondary electron yield curve for a multipactor, anti multipactor uh, coating. And the key point here is when you, um, you send one electron, if you produce less than one electron, you are in a safe region because you won't have the cascade. But if you produce one more than one electron, then you will be in trouble because you will produce a cascade. So the energy called here E1 is a key point. If you can, you are able to move the energy to high energies, you will have a, a larger safe region for your device. And what we have shown is that with uh, our coatings, the E1 energy that is represented here is around, is more than 100 electron volts, which is, which is much more than the standard coating called allodyne, which is around 40 electron volts. So we are quite confident that our coatings made of gold nanoparticles can reduce significantly the probability of a breakdown voltage and the cascade of, of electrons inside the devices. So what is for uh, tomorrow in a few words? So we will acquire, in a, we are in the process of acquiring uh, a bigger cluster source that uh, will allow us to make uh, all the nanoparticles uh, we, the customers want, alloyed, pure nanoparticles or, or caution nanoparticles in a more efficient way than today, even if we are able to make uh, thick deposits today. And we will combine this uh, deposition of nanoparticles with 
order magnetrons in order to produce nano columns, as you can see here. So we produce nanoparticles and nano columns, and this is thanks to our co-founder and colleague, uh, Dr. Jose Miguel Garcia Martin from the Institute of Micro and Nanotechnology, who is an expert in uh, growing nano columns, which are deposited in the Lansing incidents. And this will allow us to combine uh, the properties of the nano columns and also the nanoparticles in a single uh, material. First of all, thank you very much for, for your attention and I will be happy to, to answer all your questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Gibbs. Uh, I think it's time for questions. Maybe those that are attending uh, online can uh, put your question on the chat. And for sure, those that are attending here in the classroom, uh, yes, if you want to come here and make the question in order to, <laughs> to see. Don't be ashamed. There's people here, so maybe you can come for service. Uh, hello. hello. My name is Jose Luis Hueso. And thank you very much for your talk. Very clear. And I, I like the, the way you just played everything. So uh, um, question regarding when you were trying to prepare this uh, alloy, uh, nanoparticles with gold and silver, for instance. I was wondering if you had some kind of problem of uh, cross contamination with your in your targets during the the process. Yes, yes, we we yeah. This is a good question because the plasma can spread uh, atoms around uh, and so mm -hmm. on. Um, what what we found is. Uh, we, we, we didn't find any contamination after using two targets. We, we, in the case of silver and gold, we were able to make gold nano, pure gold nanoparticles or pure silver nanoparticles after making alloy nanoparticles. But this is also probably due to the fact that uh, before making the nanoparticles, we pre sputter the targets, which means that we uh, switch on the plasma and we wait a few minutes in order to clean the target from any possible contaminants. And uh, we found that this is enough to remove if there is uh, a, a contamination from another uh, magnetron. And uh, my other question was regarding your the tips that, uh, that you are uh, decorating with nanoparticles. You already mentioned, but maybe could you elaborate a little bit more about the potential troubleshooting you had with with that kind of uh, tips, or what are the more common problems you can find with those kind of tips? Well, uh, since um... Well, I, I co-founded uh, Next Tip, the company that is exploiting the, the, the patent in 2012, and uh, we have been collaborating until 2018. Uh, since then, uh, we, we have stopped, stopped this activity inside my, my, my group, and then Next Tip is doing the, the research and, and uh, developments. Um, since then, they have been working in TIPS for TIP enhanced Raman spectroscopy. And for infrared uh, spectroscopy, also, um, uh, it's it's it's. Uh, we have not worked more anymore in this in this field, but uh, I would say that is it is quite tricky, quite tricky. You you got to find the, the right conditions in order to deposit the right uh, thickness of nanoparticles on the tips, and. Um, we have tried also to make some developments for MFM, uh, depositing uh, that were uh, cobalt chromium uh, nanoparticles on, on the tips. And uh, the problem here is that 
well, you, you want the cobalt to be protected by a shell of, of chromium. Otherwise, it will oxidize and you won't have any more magnetic response. But uh, the nanoparticles, if you want to have a high resolution, have to be very small. And below nine nanometers diameter of cobalt nanoparticle, you enter into the super paramagnetic regime which is not useful for a magnetic force microscopy. So it's quite tricky. We, we have um, done a few tests and um, probably the tips will uh, have to be cooled down to low temperatures in order to recover the ferromagnetic state in order to make MFM. Uh, so we have uh, given these tips to colleagues that uh, uh, make MFM at low temperatures is not uh, an easy task, and uh, so far they have not uh, performed any any measurements. Okay. I don't okay. know if I have answered uh, your question. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. Hola, soy ¿Cómo estás? Hacía mucho que no te. Hola, ¿qué tal? Pasado una pregunta por, por bueno, bueno para los que había. Uh, I like uh, hello. Yeah, I, I think that your talk has been excellent and wonderful, and have, we have seen many applications of the ultra of the, of the magnetron sputtering and ultra high vacuum, which is a very interesting thing for me. Also. And my question is only a short question because you are already talk about the MFM tips, which is uh inter topic of interest for me so the question is can you uh, make uh, uh, nanoparticles with uh, in reactive conditions with oxygen with nitrogen or to yes fabricate uh, i don't know oxides i mean yes yes for sure <laughs> yes yes uh, usually we, uh, we we want to avoid this but um yeah i think this is the future of of this uh, technology Mm -hmm. to inject uh, not only oxygen but uh, also more complex uh, molecules um, yes uh, you you introduce um, gas species there and then you have plenty of physics or physical chemistry to to, to perform mm -hmm. um, the only the only study that we have done which is a crazy study is to inject uh, water vapor this is the last thing you would like to inject in a ultra high vacuum system, um, but we did it. And uh, what we found is that when you make a gold nanoparticles uh, and you inject a tiny uh, quantity of water vapor, uh, the water vapor sticks on, on, on the surface of the nanoparticles. And this allows you to form uh, what we call uh, satellite structures. I will, I will show you that. I think. Um, let me mm -hmm. find the slide. Oh, um, yes, I have shown this in the TN images. Yes, this one. Okay. These TM images are made of a, a gold, uh, gold nanoparticles, a big one and a smaller one, as you can see. Uh, and this is a study that we have performed uh, uh, two years ago. And these structures are. Um, uh, um, um, separated by a layer of water. Mm -hmm. That's why, that's how we have, uh, we have um, uh, the, the explanation we have found. Uh, they are not, this is not a random process. And when we inject water, we have this kind of structures. And when we do not inject water, we have a single nanoparticle with a one, one specific size. But when we inject water, we have a, a thin layer of water that makes that small and big nanoparticle 
can stick together and form these uh, Mickey Mouse uh, structures. But uh, many, many, many uh, groups are working with uh, uh, more complex uh, molecules, uh, CH4, hydrogen, I don't know, it's quite simple, but the CH4. And this is a good way to uh, modify not only the chemical composition of the nanoparticles, but also the structure of the nanoparticles. Mm -hmm. There are many, many uh, works uh, being done on that uh, field. Of course. So, thank you, Rich. Thank you. Nice to see you. I have also one general question. It's, it's about uh, um, this uh, coll collection step. Because, uh, for example, in this case, uh, uh, you collect a, in a, I mean, the, the collection chamber is always under vacuum. Yes. So it seems like uh, the, the nanoparticles uh, impact the, the surface and then uh, uh, you, you collect, then you, you, you sweep, and then you go to the TAM to, to analyze yes. the, the structure. And, and how is the how difficult is I mean how how is the yield uh, um, <laughs> the the efficiency of your process because uh, uh, just a question here we have an experimental setup set up for laser pyrolysis and and the yield is almost the it's almost very low uh, it's, it's, we have to uh, when we have to clean and so on everything is spread on the walls and this is yes. like the, the, the main bottleneck of the technology. Yes. Yes, this is a, a very good question because I say it in a simple way. Uh, you uh, eject atoms from a target, then the atoms collide uh, to each other, they make nanoparticles, and then you extract the nanoparticles and uh, they impact on the surface. Uh, it is not that simple. Um, the geometry of ex extraction it's very important. Uh, there are also work, works being done right now on this aspect. I show you an aggregation zone that is like a cone with an orifice, right? Uh, people are studying other geometries uh, like uh, a pyramidal uh, geometry, a square uh, geometry. Uh, uh, it is not clear what is the best geometry, but it has something to do with uh, the thermodynamics of, of the fluids, mm -hmm. for sure. And um, unfortunately, we don't have the tools to make all these studies. Um, but in, the, in that case, for, for the TM images, what we do is to place a TM grid in front of the beam, okay. which mm -hmm. is much easier than to to, to deposit on a subset and then try to transfer on the TM grid. Um, regarding the, the, the yield, regarding the yield, um, uh, there is a first a step is when you deposit the nanoparticles on a surface, the nanoparticles have a given stinking coefficient on the surface. And the sticking coefficient is dependent on the material of the nanoparticle and the material of the surface. And it's amazing because you, you can have uh, differences of uh, three or two uh, with the same nanoparticle, called nanoparticle, for example, on different substrates. So the time you will need to cover the whole surface with one layer of nanoparticles will depend pretty much on the surface. But once you have created this first layer, you have gold nanoparticles that will land on gold nanoparticles and the sticky coefficient will be one. Right. And uh, again, for, for the uh, yield, as you, as you saw, uh, we, we have been able to deposit two microns of gold nanoparticles for the multipactor uh, effect in one and a half year. 90, 90 minutes, okay. which is a quite high uh, uh, yield that we have even improved, uh, making a scaling up of the, of the machine. 
So that's why we think that we are in order, now in a good position to make applications for the industry of this technology that was not able, uh, not possible uh, four years ago. We, we, we were not understanding why we had a uh, few particles. And to give an idea, I would say that we can collect 10 nanoparticles per second per uh, micron square. Let's say 10, uh, 20, around that. And then the customer is asking for a powder or is asking for a solution? Yes, this is a curiosity. <laughs> yes, uh, up to now, uh, they're asking for a solution. Okay. Up to now. Um, of course, we can deliver nanoparticles deposited on the substrate. As I said, any substrate that is vacuum compatible. Mm -hmm. um, but we can also deliver nanoparticles that can be uh, dispersed in a liquid. But so far we have not this, we, we have not received uh, such inquiries. Yeah. And that's my last question is related to the, these nanocolons that you uh, uh, explain at, uh, almost at the end. You put two guns in the collection chamber, right? Yes. I mean, you have like an additional uh, plasma in the collection yes. chamber. Yes, exactly. Uh, in that case, yeah. we, we create uh, a beam of atoms, mm -hmm. not nanoparticles, atoms inside uh, the chamber. And the key point here is the geometry. Uh, you have a surface and, and a beam of the atoms. If the angle is uh, high enough, you will have the first atoms landing on the surface and the next atoms will have, will experiment a shadow effect of the first atoms in such a way that you will not be able to make a, few, a full um, layer of your atoms. You will start to grow nanocolons. Is highly dependent on the angle. It's called. It is called. Uh, um, uh, it's uh, called glancing incidence uh, angle deposition. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So th this is the this is the uh, concept of uh, nanosteel. This is the main concept of the uh, no. last latest company. No. No. Um, the deposition are glancing angle for, for making the nanocolumns uh, is not patented, it's not protected. Okay. Uh, the production of the nanoparticles is protected by a patent. Mm -hmm. But we, since we, we, we have uh, our colleague, uh, Jose Miguel Garcia Martin, who is an expert in uh, uh, making nanocolumns, we thought that this could be a good opportunity to combine uh, nanocolumns together with nanoparticles. For example, uh, Jose Miguel has demonstrated that the nanocolumns have an antibacterial activity because of the, the morphology of the nanocolumns. And uh, it is also uh, quite good in harvesting uh, light in solar cells. So nanocolumns have also a lot of applications. And we think that if we combine both, Actually, we already did it. We, we have combined titanium uh, nanocolumns, titanium oxide nanocolumns with gold nanoparticles for some photocatalytic reactions, and it works. Uh, so we will we'll try to combine these two nanostructures in, into a single product. Yeah. Really nice, good, very good, very good ideas. Yes, <laughs> I like too much. Well, uh, <laughs> What, what really I wanted to say is that we, we have been facing problems. Uh, problems in making a more um, exotic nanoparticles. So we had to make a prototype for, with three magnetrons. Then we have been facing a problem measuring AFM. So we had to improve the resolution. Then we have been facing problems with the yield. So we had to make this full phase erosion magnetron. So it's just, just because we had problems. So sometimes problems are good. 
Any other question here? Come on. No, no on the chat, no. So I think make a big applause to Thank you very much.